Good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a little bit of a frog in my throat today. So, ha good afternoon to everybody in the room. Good afternoon to everybody who's joined us online today as well. Um, my name's Pete Connolly. I'm the archaeology manager for HFA, Humber Field Archaeology. We're a rare company in the sense that we are a local government-based organisation. There's a few of us left in the country. Um, we are part of Hull City Council um, and have been since there has been a Hull City Council during the reconstruction of the, the area from Humberside to a number of unitary authorities in the 1990s. I've been the archaeology manager with Humber Field Archaeology for a couple of years now. And <clears throat> I'm coming at this from a different angle from Sarah Jane today. Sarah Jane's talked about sort of route ways into the profession. I'm really giving a, a project example of the work that we've done recently in Hull to try and include as wide a range of people in our major um, South Blockhouse archaeological project as possible. So, a little bit of background. Our project um, is part of a wider South Blockhouse project where we're basically going to try and, can you all see the, the red laser pointer? Probably not. Ah, well, not to worry. I'm going to walk around. So, it starts off as car park. It ends as car park. It's not very inspiring. <coughs> but that's only stage one. What the dig is about is inspiring um, what comes next, a visitable open area space that is an open area free attraction within the city that encapsulates part of Hull's maritime history and something that dates back to the 16th century. It's funded via National Highways, who are doing the major A63 operation um, through the, the heart of Hull, and um, is also funded by Hull City Council itself and supported by Historic England. The site's a scheduled ancient monument, um, so we've, we've made sure that Historic England are on board with every facet of the project that we're carrying out. I'm not really going to go much into the history and the archaeology of the site to date. That's a talk for another day, and that's a talk that lasts about an hour, um, and I only have 20 minutes today. But as you can see here in the timeline, um, it's identified as a site um, for fortification in 1539. Henry VIII visits Hull twice. He likes it so much, he comes back a second time. In um, 1541, actually, he's en route up to York and then comes back to Hull. And he basically looks at fortifications. We've got city walls on three sides. We've got the Hull. We've got the Hull. But this open one here um, is denoted as um, how in need of fortification. This becomes a central fortification um, in Hull's history that um, has a chapter during the English Civil War um, and construction of the Hull Citadel. After that, it's used as a prisoner for the Scots. We are always getting up to problems. Um, uh, um, during the Jacobite Rebellion, um, and then is eventually remodelled as a naval storehouse during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, it only disappears from the story in 1863-1864. The site I'm talking about is the South Block House, this one, that sits on, well, it used to sit on the edge of the estuary. It's about you know, 50 metres away now. Um, like I say, the archaeology is for another day. From the start, we wanted to make sure that this was a community inclusion project, something that reached out to people across Hull and the satellite towns and villages of East Yorkshire, but also joining people from the south side of the Humber, North Lincolnshire, North East Lincolnshire. The first thoughts um, are about the site village. How do we set up a site that makes sure it includes as many people as possible? So little things, logistics behind it, making sure that there's a disabled toilet on site with a ramp. Importantly, in the disabled toilet, there are baby, there's a baby changing kit in there as well, a drop down board. Now this becomes very important as we go on further into the lecture itself. Um, two lots of toilets. We both have male and female and non-gender toilets as well. So catering for um, that inclusiveness. Our one failing, as you can undoubtedly see, is that we have to stack one cabin on top of another um, because we just don't have the space. But everything else um, is at ground level. So again, from a, a physical activity, being able to get into the rooms, um, we tried as hard as we could. Um, and I, yeah, it's one regret that we couldn't put that, um, so we had to stack two. I gave a good view of the site. 
and for photographs, but um, it's not perfect. But saying that, we made sure that the site photograph. And as you all know, <coughs> site cabins um, do require a step up. So we made sure that we bought a portable ramp for wheelchair access and for anybody who can actually physically step up into the cabin themselves. These things are relatively cheap. Sarah Jane has mentioned them herself. You can see that they can take a maximum weight of up to 600 pounds. So they're very physical, they're a good thing. And they actually have a carry fold, so you can move them around, you can pick them, um, collapse them, move them from site to site, around from cabin to cabin. Um, it's very easy and portability um, is important here. And it means that we can reuse it time and time again. So from that point of view, we wanted to make sure that anybody with a, a physical challenge um, could access the site as much as possible. Uh, we were very lucky that once we stripped um, the upper surfaces, um, we came down onto a, a finely laid um, brick surface that dates to the beginning of the 19th century. So we actually had a very good hard surface to walk on and get people digging from as well. So that, I have to say, did help. This meant that we could offer um, the project wide and far. Um, and <clears throat> I think this is important, that part of our level of inclusivity is obviously including different people from all walks of life, but actually working with other organisations within the city to attract people, not trying to do it all ourselves. But very often is the case that a lot of archaeology projects and, and archaeologists try to do everything themselves without bringing in partner organisations. So we worked with Hay Volunteering, who came out of the City of Culture, that stands for Hull and East Yorkshire Volunteering. They have a cadre of volunteers. We have our own volunteer network, and we work with the East Riding Archaeological Society to attract 120 volunteers to the site um, from all walks of life, no previous archaeological experience required. We were there to help guide all the discoveries made on site were made by um, the volunteers. <coughs> over an 11 week period, making sure that people had access to it. If they've got working lives, the volunteers team ran from a Wednesday to a Sunday. So people who have weekends free could actually come down and work on site. So people who have a working life who might not be able to access the site during a working week had an opportunity to come down to site at the weekends. It did mean that um, over 11 weeks, our volunteer team gave over four and a half thousand volunteer hours to the project. One of the attractiveness through any volunteer network, especially in archaeology, is that archaeology helps the five key tenants of health and well-being very easily. Um, connect with other people, working alongside strangers that you've never met before in your past from different walks of life, and volunteering, you're connecting. Um, be physically active. We all know how physically active archaeology can be. Um, <clears throat> learn new skills. All of these people are learning the skills of an archaeologist. Give to others. These people gave their time to us. They gave four and a half thousand hours to the project alone. And pay attention to the present moment. Now, we all know that there's nothing better in many ways in archaeology as you're uncovering that object that's not been touched for hundreds, thousands of years, that you become very in that moment. You pay attention to that very, very precious moment in time where you suddenly realise that nobody else has touched that object for such a long period of time. So paying attention to the present moment, mindfulness is something which is inherently inbuilt into the archaeological process. We work with various charities um, across the city. So we work with the National In Initiative for Creative Education. Um, I won't go into the blog. You can sit here um, and, um, and read that as I'm talking. Um, but basically, working with, the, working with NICE, we were able to bring refugees and asylum seekers down to the site, people who had moved to Hull um, for various economic or religious or whatever reasons. Um, it could be people like myself. You know, I was new to Hull. A lot of people actually coming down to the site were, have been living in Hull a lot longer than I have. Um, and making sure that <clears throat> the site was there, available from people who have just come to the city and maybe finding it hard to settle in. Um, the best way that we found doing this was through storytelling. So we have two actors out on site in the upper um, image um, telling a story. One of them, um, so these are the Roaring Girls, the, the first one's playing Henry VIII, the Protestant who wants to be the head of the Catholic, um, sorry, the head of the Church of England, and a bricklayer 
um, who is Catholic, um, who has an on-site spat with Henry, telling the story of friction and turmoil during this period. Um, we worked with Joe Hakim, uh, a local um, author and writer, to engage young people in the storytelling process. I'll come back to our work with NICE a little bit later on. Working with the Armed Forces Community Hub, um, these are people who have come out through the Armed Forces, um, many of them with mental health issues, um, as they are moving into civilian life. Mental health issues is something that um, obviously comes up and plays throughout these activities. Um, what we decided to do, again, through an arts and creative process, was make sure that the people who were digging had access to all of the opportunities that we'd have to everybody else. But they got involved in producing um, sketch drawings and um, colour images, um, paintings and things like that, but also took the cloverleaf design of the South Blockhouse and um, created these tiles each of them individually made to reflect something from their military career. The South Blockhouse is a military site, so it made a lot of sense to get military people involved in the project. I don't have a military background. I don't have those life experiences. So it was good to get these people involved, some of them working through their own uh, mental health issues as well. I love the fact that one of them left us with a quote that says, working shoulder to shoulder with a group of people with the same aim reminded me of my time in the forces. It was hard work, but so worthwhile and very rewarding, especially when you see your first find start to emerge from the soil. You're the first to see that object for hundreds of years. You get such a sense of achievement. I am, this is the sort of thing that we wanted to bring out and engender through the project. We work with um, arts charities, so Absolutely Cultured are one of the arts charities within Hull. Um, they work with um, deprived, economically deprived communities, communities that um, often get described as being left behind. Um, <clears throat> in this example, we brought a group from Gypsyville down to site, gave them a site tour, talked about archaeology, talked about stratigraphy. This inspired them to go away and make their own stratigraphy jars. Now, this is a cheap thing to do. Each of these is just a jar from their kitchen, something that has been finished. It could be a jam jar, it could be a curry sauce jar, it mean, doesn't matter. Um, absolutely cultured, um, supplied the coloured sand. And through the project, the art project, they were able to create these stratigraphy jars. And preciously, which I love, is that inside each of those jars, there's a single object left by the person who made them. We have no idea what those objects are. We've never opened the jars. They just sit there in the middle of the sand. Another way of engaging people with the heritage, the archaeology of site, where they might not be able to come and dig on site and access the site. So using that idea of, right, what artistic outputs can we can we gather from just the process of doing archaeology alone? I still have these jars, and we were able to exhibit them um, as part of our final open day. Um, and here is a little bit of text from Absolutely Culture themselves. We also worked with the Goodwin Trust. The Goodwin Trust were set up many years in a deprived part of Hull, um, not far from the city centre. Um, they work across a number of charity streams. Um, youth Arts Takeover, um, and then This Ability, which specialises in supporting and progressing 18 to 29-year-olds with a disability or learning disability, difficulty or long-term mental health, health conditions into employment. Um, the two young men in the orange um, flash jackets, we didn't pick them out, we didn't want to, but they wanted to wear them themselves, so we were happy with that. Um, these two young men here, came to us and worked with us on site through the disability process. The youth arts takeover process is basically taking the archaeology and using that inspiration to do other youth art style um, outputs. They produced um, audio vignettes, um, online magazine, uh, a light touch comedy historical podcast that was created with one of the up and coming um, comedians, stand up comedians in Hull. Um, and the process here is all of these outputs are guided by the Goodwin Trust team, but they are made by young people. So that could be recording the audio vignettes, setting up the audio rooms to make sure that they work, um, editing, story writing, narrative writing, setting up the sound for the podcast, producing the magazine. It's bringing people into the workplace environment 
and giving them a challenge, but also giving them something in their lives that may take them from unemployment um, through into a new workplace stream themselves. So this is working with the Goodman Trust, again, has produced that. And I'll, again, I will come back to the Goodman Trust. We made sure that we were free to all visitors. I mean, one of the beautiful things about Hull is that every attraction in Hull, except for the deep, um, is free. All of our museums are free. Uh, our art gallery is free. Um, we made sure that this is free. You know, it's, it's a place where people who might be financially impoverished can still access heritage and archaeology and history very, very easily. We wanted to make sure that that played out through our project. So we were open um, four hours a day, Wednesday to a Sunday. People could just rock on up. They didn't have to book in. Um, and they could talk to an archaeologist, talk to a volunteer, find out what's going on. We draw on people in, and then we and through that process, we actually drew in volunteers as well. Um, and we had two open days: one as part of the Festival of Archaeology at the beginning of the project, and the second one at the very end attracted 1,020 visitors in four and a half hours. So that's 226 visitors an hour. That's the sort of numbers that a lot of major attractions would love to see walking through their doors. We were overwhelmed. We, were, we thought we'd be lucky if we got about 500. Um, once we got the first 200 in the first hour, we thought, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people coming down. We made sure that there were activities for children. So this is Hull Scrap Store, um, where they bring scraps and they were building things with kids out on site. Kids and adults could do artwork. There were site talks. There was music all sort of thing. There was um, free pottage if you wanted it um, <clears throat> to get a taste of um, Tudor England. Um, so making sure that we were there to bring in as many people as possible. I talked a lot about the on-site work. We had the finest displays there as well. People who are interested in artifacts, the different classes of it. And you can actually just see down in the bottom corner, there's a ramp as well, which we could bring out at any moment. Um, and so we made sure that people weren't just engaging with the, the site archaeology, they were engaging with the finds narrative as well, as well as the history of the site. We made sure that we worked with the media. Now, it's very easy for us to, in many ways, archaeology to attract national attention, digging for Britain, Channel 5, CBA, um, and do our own social media. But we want to make sure that we majored locally and regionally, especially, and I think this is important again, that... Um, we don't control the narrative with this site. This is, this is Hull's site. You know, they, they don't need a Scotsman to tell them about their history. Um, but we work with Hull History Nerd, who is a local YouTuber um, who produces um, history documentaries. If you, if you want to check him out, please do. His documentaries are excellent and are really high class and as good as many professional documentaries. He produces this as, an, as a hobby. He already has... Um, nearly 10,500 subscribers to his website. This draws in a lot of people. So he, we made sure that he had full access to the site and he done a 40 minute um, documentary on the history of Hulls, Hulls Castle and the Citadel, which has drawn in thousands of views as well. So we are here to kind of give that narrative over. We don't have to be the power that holds it. Survey data, we're always interested in survey data. You can see um, is it your first time visiting um, on an archaeological dig? Sort of, yes, 54, no, 43. Would you visit, be involved in another archaeological dig? Yes, 96, no, 2. It's a pretty good return. Would you recommend this activity to a friend? Yes, 101, no, 0. So even the two people who wouldn't want to get involved in it again, this is what I believe, um, if, I'm, if I'm taking it that everybody who answered these questions are the same people, the two people who wouldn't come on it would still recommend it to a friend. This is, that's lovely. That's brilliant. Um, and we've got distance travel data. We've got age data. We've got gender data. Um, and then we actually have, are your day-to-day -day activities limited because of health problems or impairment which has lasted or expected to last at least 12 months? Because we're part of Hull City Council, we have a data collection team that informs us of how we should be structuring our questionnaires. So we don't ask, are you disabled? Are you physically less abled? Are you physically challenged, mentally challenged? It doesn't matter what. Actually, uh, 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 you know, taking the advice of the data team, um, it's actually asking about where do your health problems lead you? And you can see here that, yes, a lot, three, 
Yes, a little 13, no 53. That roughly works out at about 22, 20%, 20%, which when I sat in on Sarah Jane's talk, um, um, funded by Historic England, she was saying that kind of works out at the national average. Um, we got anonymous data after walking to help with health. It was interesting to learn more on Hull history. This is somebody who just dropped in. We did have somebody lined up who has worked with us in the past, who's um, a thalidomide. Sadly, the day before she was come down to site, she got COVID. So she wasn't able to come and work with us. Subsequently, she has been to our, been to our offices um, and has been recording part of her journey um, as a, a thalidomide victim across her life with people who are putting a whole uh, a, a sort of national documentary together. Um, so we, we keep in touch with this person and we're hoping to have her back. Um, use crutches to walk, um, multiple ankle surgery. Again, making sure that these groups of people can access our site was inbuilt into the project from the beginning. Working with NICE, I said it would come back to this. Um, age, adult, children, 57% um, children, 43% adult. Um, you can see a big, a big swing to female over male. Importantly, taking the advice from NICE, asylum seekers um, and people who have uh, come to the country from those types of backgrounds won't necessarily have childminders. So if they're going to come to site, they're going to come as a family. So if a family comes down to site, you need to make sure that that family has changing room activities. Something where um, if it's a, it's a whole family coming down with three generations, possibly three generations within the family, if you have access to a changing room, that's going to make their life a lot easier and is going to attract them to the site. So when we got that disabled toilet, when we put it on hire, we, had, we specifically asked, does it come with cha baby changing facilities? So that um, we could include um, those groups of people as freely and openly as possible. And you can see here, from the data that they collected, first language, English is only sitting at 20%, Arabic 25%, Kurdish 17 Turkish, Polish, Pashto, Ukrainian, Lithuanian, Armenian. You know, they have access to groups of people that we don't necessarily have access to. So we're making sure that by working with partners within the city, we're bringing in a wider group. We're being as inclusive as we can. What's next for the site? <coughs> Excuse me, I don't mean to sound so squeaky. Um, I talked about the fact that there will be an open attraction on site, picking out the remains of the South Block House. This is it as visualised at the moment with an entranceway. This is all on the same level. So again, we want it to be openly accessed as possible. We're thinking about signage, a lovely little kind of by story. I'm standing in the kitchen one Sunday evening doing the Sunday roast doing roast chicken. Somebody says, have you got the Yorkshire puddings? Oh yeah, the Yorkshire puddings. I don't have time to make Yorkshire puddings. I've got two little ones. I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old. And um, so out the freezer comes the Aunt Bessie's. Now, Aunt Bessie's, a fine, uh, loved Hull institution. For those who know Aunt Bessie's Yorkshire puddings, they're made in Hull. Um, on the back of their uh, material um, is this, this kind of QR code-like thing. And actually, this is a Navi Lens thing that when you scan it from the Navi Lens app, it tells you what's in the packet, it tells you how to cook it, it tells you what the calorific rate is and everything else um, audibly. Um, we have looked at bringing something like this into our signage. Now, this is proprietary. So we're, we're, um, Navi Lens is a Spanish um, organization. Um, whether we go down a proprietary thing, but this is something that we're actively looking at. Um, and so you can download free room indicators from their website. Um, I could scan this now and put my phone to the microphones and you'd be able to hear it. But basically, signage with words on it, anybody who may be visually impaired, um, if they have the NaviLens app, they can scan around, it'll pick it up, it'll tell you how far away that board is, and it can be scanned from you know, a good 10 metres further away. Um, and then it will read out the text that you want it to read out. So again, trying to be as inclusive as possible, even in the next part of the project. Last thing, we've inspired the young people um, from the Youth Arts Takeover to produce um, a role-playing game based on the South Block House. 
Um, the role-playing game comes in two forms, a freely available 16-bit style Japanese RPG style role-playing game. You, it costs nothing. You can download it, you can play it through your browser. Um, and then a tabletop um, D6 version, which you can print and play. This is entirely guided um, by the, the group through the Youth Arts Takeover. It's called Time Fort 1555. Um, so the, the main gameplay takes place about 10 years after the, the blockhouse has been built. This is the point in time when it is now um, under the financial management of, of Hull itself. And then the, the tabletop version is called Time Fort Eternia. I think this is lovely because this is actually segues into what we're here to talk about today, is for us, in the point of inclusivity, it's creating the story deciding the outcomes, but most importantly, for all of us, for a sustainable future, shaping the future. Um, so this is the poster that they put together, um, and I'm going to finish with just a little bit of music that they put together as part of the in-game music. Who would have thought that a 16th century device fort could inspire a sort of late 80s style uh, Terminator style piece of music? Thank you very much.